so yeah once more we should be live um on youtube right now um for the very last time in the form of a let's call it regular session um um yeah because uh, tomorrow on the 10 participants of the global groove electronic music journalism workshop program hosted by groove in collaboration with the good institute will offer their own perspectives on music journalism in a globalized world. Should you have any questions or comments on today's session, then please um, uh, just use the YouTube live chat. Uh, we will have a look at it and uh, try to ask on your behalf. Um, so yeah, so today's session will be hosted by Laura Aha, my colleague and uh, partner in crime for this workshop program. Um, and yeah, after we've discussed conflicts of interest yesterday, uh, putting a focus on more structural issues, uh, she will talk about the individual responsibilities and predicaments that shape our experience as music journalists. What are we ethically allowed to report on? What are we obliged to let our audiences know? Where do we draw the lines and which boundaries must we respect or which must we cross? Um, as you have noticed, um, uh, probably if you've been following us uh, throughout the previous sessions, um, the topic of ethics and boundaries in general um, is a crucial one in a strain of music journal, uh, in a strain of journalism uh, that doesn't really pos position itself outside um, of the field that it's reporting on, but rather tries to, um, well, um, offer criticism and reflections on a certain scene that it is uh, an inherent part of. So um, I would say that Laura is very well equipped um, uh, to talk about this specific subject, uh, not only because she's a very experienced music journalist. In 2017, she found herself at the center of an international discussion sparked by comments made in her presence by a DJ with whom she was traveling at that point as a journalist, uh, which resulted in her being scrutinized and uh, criticized personally by the media and also fans. Uh, I'm happy that she stood her ground back then and even more so that she will shed some light on this crucial moment in the discussion around sexism in the dance music community today. Welcome Laura and thank you very much. Hi guys, thanks very much for the intro and um, yeah I'm looking forward to today's session. Um, I think we have already built up some tension <laughs> leading us here because um, yeah, um, as Christopher already said, it's, it's uh, been uh, evident in the last sessions that we have that those questions of ethics and boundaries seem to be uh, questions that are important to all of us and they have come up quite um, several times. So um, this is why I think it's really nice and important that we get to talk about this today. Um, yeah, as Christopher has already talked about ethical questions um, concerning interdependencies within the wide field of the music industry, um, I would like to take a closer look at the relationship between us as reporters and the artists as the subjects we interview and spend time with and then in the end report on. Um, to give you an overview of what I'm going to do, um, therefore I'm going to give you a little bit of input first. Um, on what the International Federation of Journalists has to say on the topic of ethics in journalism. Afterwards, I would like to point out why, especially in the field of music journalism, it is often not quite so easy to stick to those theoretical standards, if you will, um, what possible conflicts can arise from this and get into a discussion with you on how to handle them the best way we possibly can. So let's get started. <laughs> um, as we were talking about, the necessity of um, disclaimers and transparency yesterday at length with Christopher. I would like to make a disclaimer beforehand. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I'm not a media law professional of any sort or I don't know, trained in the field of law. So I will, of course, not be able to get into juristic specifications here, especially since we all operate in different countries um, with different legislation. So it's pretty difficult to find a, like a generalization here. Um, I would rather like to see this as an opportunity for all of us to discuss and to, uh, to just exchange experience that you might have had and we'll share some of my experiences and then we can um, maybe find the best solution together. So yeah, Christopher has already started the presentation. Um, yeah, let's go to the first sheet, please. Um, the International Federation of Journalists, short IFJ, 
actually, as I was preparing for this workshop, I was immediately only, of course, thinking about how things are done in Germany and how they are organized here, because that's what you basically talk about in journalism school. And that's what you know. Uh, so I didn't even know that there was an international organization um, or a set of rules for this. So, well, luckily there is. It's uh, the International Federation of Journalists. It claims to be the world's organ uh, largest organization of journalists representing over 600,000 media professionals from 187 trade unions and associated in more than 140 countries. Um, this organization was founded and established in 1926, and it speaks for journalists within the United Nations system and within the international trade union movement. So it's responsible for organizing collective action to support journalist unions in their fight for fair play, uh, fair pay, sorry, <laughs> decent working conditions and in defense of their labor rights. Um, furthermore, it promotes international action to defend press freedom and social justice for strong, free and independent trade unions of journalists, something that also came up in Christopher's talk yesterday. We had a, yeah, we had a talk about unions uh, as being a very important structural factor. So this is um, maybe something we can all look into a little bit more. Um, so the IFJ fights for gender equality in all its structures, policies, and programs, opposes discriminations of all kinds, and condemns the use of media as propaganda or to promote intolerance and conflict. Also, they claim to believe in freedom of political and cultural expression. Um, and the Federation claims not to subscribe to any given political viewpoint, point, but to promote collective action to defend human rights, democracy, and media pluralism. Um, therefore, they support journalists and their unions um, whenever they are fighting for their industrial and professional rights and have established an international safety fund even to provide humanitarian aid for journalists in need. So why am I telling you all this? <laughs> um, it's because they are also responsible for putting together the Global Charter of Ethics for Journalists. If we could please have the next sheet. Yeah, this is it. Um, maybe we can, yeah, I can give you some time to read this. This is the preamble of it. Okay, so as we can see, um, this version we have here, um, there has been obviously been an older version of this declaration of principles on the conduct of journalists from 1954, known as the Bordeaux Declaration. Um, this updated version here is from 2019, which we can actually see if you look into some of the articles they um, refer to, including postings on social media and your research and stuff like that. So and they have adjusted this to the changing uh, media landscape in the digital age. So this very first paragraph, um, it already refers to Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, which I'm going to quote, everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and without interference and to seek, receive and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. So um, this is very important that this is quoted here in the very beginning. Um, another important point made here, I think, is stressing that the journalist, the quote, I quote, the journalist's responsibility towards the public takes precedence over any other responsibility, in particular toward the employers and the public authorities. So basically this is stating the interest of the general public about a certain subject you report on should always be at the core of any decision that is to be made accordingly. Just to keep that in mind when we were going to discuss things later, because as we have already learned yesterday in Christopher's talk, those conflicts of interests are so inherently inscribed into the field of music journalism, um, for example, through structural codependencies within the music industry itself, so that it's actually utopian to hope to never come across any of those conflicts of interests yourself, even if you have the best intentions, so they might occur at some point. 
Um, as we have talked a lot about those conflicts between different parties inside the music industry, I would like to take a closer look now at conflicts of interest that occur in our direct exchange with the artists themselves. And therefore I would like to show you a little clip. Yeah, let me do this there. The other kids make fun of him because of how young he looks. Nobody includes him. They call him the narc behind his back. They do? One day, you'll be cool. So you're the kid who's been sending me those articles from the school newspaper. What do you like, the star of your school? They hate me. This is Rolling Stone magazine. We got a couple copies of your stories. I think you should be writing for us. We can only pay, let me see, $700. All right, a grand. I'd like to interview you or somebody from your band. Oh, the enemy, a rock writer. How old are you? 17. Me too. Actually, I'm 16. Me too. Isn't it funny? The truth just sounds different. I'm 15. If you're going to be a true journalist, you cannot make friends with the rock star. They're going to fly you places for free. You're going to meet girls. Oh, God, it's going to get ugly. I am telling secrets to the one guy you don't tell secrets to. I know what's going on. Your mom called! I have family members with severe anxiety problems. Hey, you want to go to a party with some good people looking to have a good time? Don't take drugs! Your mom kind of freaked me out. It's Bowie! Rock stars have kidnapped my son. I am a golden god! home you are home oh man you made friends with them well it was fun because they make you feel cool and hey i met you you are not cool yep <laughs> um yeah i don't know most of you um i guess might know this movie um called Almost Famous. It came out in 2000 and it was made by Cameron Crowe who started writing about music himself at the age of 15 in the early 70s and later became editor at Rolling Stone. So as you can probably see, there are a lot of autobiographical details in this movie, obviously. Um, for those of you who don't know the movie, the plot circles around this young journalist, William Miller, who writes about rock music besides school until he meets music journalist Lester Banks, who actually was a real music journalist, as we know. Um, who's brilliantly played here by Philip Seymour Hoffman. And um, William manages to go on tour with them with the newcomer band Stillwater um, soon after he meets Lester Banks. And um, the, art, the reportage he's supposed to write will be his first article he's going to write for Rolling Stone magazine, which of course at the time was the most important publication in the field of rock music. It obviously is the era of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. He's young and inexperienced. The band is pretty unprofessional, constantly on acid, taking underage girls on tour with them. So in general, it's safe to say that this movie is very problematic in many ways, <laughs> absolutely male gaze centered and extremely glamorizing this era. Um, but even if no magazine today would let you go on an extensive tour for weeks with one band to write one cover story for, which you will then even you paid a thousand dollars, like good old times. Um, still, I think it's a great example to show the struggles we as music journalists are confronted with when we get in personal contact with artists for a professional feature. Um, along the way of the, the journey, William and the band um, encounter a couple of ethical questions that occur, uh, which brings me back to the Global Charter of Ethics for Journalists um, I've just introduced. Um, it, originally consisted, it originally consists of 16 bullet points in total. I just want to go a little bit deeper into five of them. 
that I consider particularly relevant for our field of journalism. So if you could have the next sheet. Yeah, this is, I'm just gonna quickly read it. Um, the journalist shall use only fair methods to obtain information, images, documents, and data, and he or she will always report his or her status as a journalist and will refrain from using hidden recordings or in images and sound, except where it is impossible for him or her to collect information that is overwhelmingly in the public interest. He or she will demand free access to all sources of information and the right to freely investigate all facts of public interest. So yeah, as you've already heard in the little trailer, like they're calling the journalist the enemy because um, because they know that he has a lot of power, obviously, like he can really make an impact with his writing. And um, I have, I would like to go into a first discussion with you. Um, so as this movie is set in the 70s, obviously, William can't carry around his recording device at all times, which you can see like he, uh, he takes a lot of notes, but he like he has this really stiff recorder that needs to be plugged into the wall. So he's not able to record everything um, that he sees. And in one scene, a band member even throws away his notes. Um, so what do you think? Can he still use everything he saw and memorized for the reportage or even, um, even if it's not recorded? Like, how can, how can you do that? Yeah, you can just say. <laughs> just... I, don't, I don't know if I understand the question, but for me, in, in the past times when, when I inter interview people, I always uh, record the interview because uh, it, for me, it's the best, the best way, the best, uh, um, yeah, it's the best way to, trans to, to, to do a transcription later. Uh, but in, if, if, I can remember if some, in some, if some people, that I interview say something that I I doesn't want to hear or or, or the public show need need to hear. In, in in some cases, what happened to me was that the answers were more like the civil rights people that that I don't know. They are more not not comfortable. But but for me, I don't know. It's if you are interviewing something, or if you are doing a reportage in a in a festival or in a, or in a club, in a club, it's for me. It's it's, it's, a, it's a tool. It's a very very important tool. To record the things and and more is is easier because we can we can record it in in our, in our cell phones and it's 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 more easy. In, in the past times, you you should have an an a record. Uh, part so mm. yeah sure, I don't sure. know if I, I, if I answered it. Uh, no I, I, I totally uh, agree like if you do an, an interview that is really sad that you know like you have an hour then you sit down and you take like you take out your recorder and you tape it and it's I, I was more thinking about the situation that you are with somebody for a couple of days I mean you cannot have your recording I mean you can but you know what I mean like it's you're not going to run around and even I have had sometimes had the feeling that some people are also not very comfortable or like they talk differently when you when they see that you have a thing in your hand and then like you have conversations on the side I mean that's what happens to to Will as well like he's hanging out with them in the in the backstage and stuff like like how do you feel about those kind of things yeah, I mean get, yeah yeah I, I, I understand now the on and off uh, thing, yeah. If, if you are you, you spend a couple of days with with an artist and an artist say something that you know that is it's it's not a it's not a thing. It's not a good thing. It's not a constructive thing. I think it uh, directly redirectly you to a question: the why you do why what you do? Because if you do music journalism for money. Why will you go into a, a struggle with an artist, with an, a record label, or, or what I or what I know? But if you are ma making music journalism to change the world, you can't to be indifferent because if you are indifferent, you are part of the problem. Simple as that. Yeah, yeah. I think it's this thing of public interest that I stressed in the beginning, and that's also in this um, in this first um, first quote that was on the sheet here. Um, yeah, I think this is um, 
definitely if it's uh, yeah this is something we need to consider if it's of public interest or not and um yeah it's not that, like I, it's like all the questions i'm going to ask are more like dis discussion questions like there are no really definite answers even what you are just um, coming up with off record on the record i will get to that later um it's really like everything is really so up to interpretation like there are really no really set rules to be honest like i was really trying to do to find find a definite answer but it's really hard so like there are no rights or wrong i'm just more interested uh, in, in your experience and how you see those things yeah, I would maybe chime in to say that, yes, um, uh, trying to record pretty much everything and have it on the record officially um, uh, is, um, is the best way to go or the best practice, so to speak, um, because it basically protects both the journalist and uh, the interview subject, obviously. But that's uh, hardly ever the case that, like, oh, at least there, there are situations in which that, that, is, that is not possible. And, uh, well, um, I think uh, there needs to be at least um, uh, the question of trust is, of course, important. Uh, I recently had a politician um, uh, call me after I published an interview with, with him and uh, thanked, he thanked me for for transcribing um, this interview, like, you know, just as I thought would be like the regular way to go. But obviously, um, it dawned on me afterwards that he's so used to being basically misquoted or that someone will just take some notes and then just like write down whatever he said in a sort of like very condensed and very, um, um, well, a sort of ex abstracted way in which like the sense is still somehow maintained but um uh, it's it's not really uh, what he said but more like a, the gist of it so to speak and uh, that of course uh, you can say that that's fair especially when it comes to politician who uh, you know speaks always uh, in the in the um uh, on on matters of public interest right because that's what politics is um but it gets a lot more tricky of course if you if you're dealing with people who are not because is a dj for example a person of public interest you could argue that yes at least to a certain subculture um uh, but you could also argue that like no whatever they say in off the record um uh, could just be completely irrelevant uh, to the world except of course if they pick up on more uh, fundamental issues but we'll get, get to that later i think mm -hmm. yeah Ilga, did you want to say something or um Sorry. yes i guess uh i mean yeah it would be always safe and the better way probably to record but if you're like spending more than one day uh i guess i would try it like if i think what they say might be relevant i would probably take notes to keep the uh, like to keep it like uh, the tr in the true form um like to write it down as uh, soon as possible uh and i don't know if but i'm i would still not be sure if it would be okay for me to quote that I mean, on the one hand, okay, well, the person maybe didn't give the permission for that sentence or what they said off the record. But on the other hand, uh, the person that I'm with knows that I'm like doing this work, like I'm with them, not as a friend or just like a, somebody else, but as a journalist. So I don't know, I would probably maybe ask permission afterwards. Oh, okay, I heard you say this and I thought it would be uh, relevant. Uh, like, can I use this maybe? Mm -hmm. Because I, I didn't have the permission beforehand. Maybe. Yeah, I think you, you're, you're touching upon a, a couple of uh, important points. I think uh, what you say, like, and uh, also this off record, on record, I will get to that later. But um, this thing, like, are you, I mean, you are in your professional role with them all the time, I'd say. I mean, I, I wonder, like, is there any moment of private time when you're spending it? On, I mean, you still, you know what I mean? Like, this is also like kind of a problem um, in those conversations. But yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky one, definitely. And also, like, when we, um, when we consider um, the situation on tour and um, this uh, little article I just read that you have to disclose that you are a journalist, what about the other people you meet? Like when you are in the backstage and there are some fans or there are some, I don't know, other friends of them or whatever, like 
do you have to disclose to everybody you're talking to that you are a journalist? Like, how do we handle those kind of things and how do we include them? What do you think? It's interesting all this because if you ask permission for all the, the persons will act the the, the the personality you know mm -hmm. if, if if i am if i'm saying all around hey i am a, i am a journalist be care be care because if i hear you or if as i see you i will report it i mean it's yeah, it's a fine enemy, like it's say. a fine line it's a fine line it is a fine line so but for me for me it's always for, for me it's a it's, it's it's a very close question for me it's in, in which side are you in which side are you playing um, you are human first, and you, you and, and music lover second, and raver third, and in the fourth, you are a music journalist. But first, you are you are uh, a human. If you, as a human, are spent a couple of days with people, and these people forgot that you, before being a, a music journalist, you are a human, and 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 just and just I don't know. They naturally are shit persons i don't know for me it's clear that you as a music journalist after being a person you have a, for me this is a, a personal opinion for me you have a you have a mission you have a mission if you can't be indifferent for me you can, in these times you can't be indifferent because the the, the whole story uh, have been indifferent to, to 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 such of most of the problems in the world, such as racist, so, such a discrimination, such a such a misogyny, misanthropy, to all to all these things. Uh, so for me, yeah. for me, it's very easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's also definitely. I mean, maybe we can agree on this thing of, of public interest. Like this is the thing you have to keep in mind. Like, is this really necessary for? The public to know or do i have to like who do i have to serve like do i have to serve the artists to protect them or do i have like i think this is a thing yeah um i think um uh, what we also have to keep in mind that there's uh, one option of uh trying to retrospectively kind of clear things up which would be uh, what ideally every magazine would have, but no magazine, at least not in the music world, really has is fact checkers who would then uh, try to get in touch with the people, for example, and ask, has this really happened like that? Or like, is, I don't know, like there was this, there was this example when we talked about features and reportages um, of that Mount Erie um, a feature where there's like David Lynch playing on his car stereo, you know, and usually in well-funded music journalism, someone would call up um, 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 Phil uh, Alvarum and ask him, do you really listen to David Lynch in the car? So uh, that would be another institution, so to speak, uh, that um, would uh, try to um, con con confirm all this and verify it. Uh, so in order as, you know, like um, there's no, like uh, the ethical conflicts about, uh, like we are reporting from this um, are a little bit reduced. Although obviously um, the people, especially in the music world, uh, like I explained yesterday, have also an interest in uh, maybe sometimes making things look a little nicer than maybe they were uh, seen through the journalist's eye. So again, also there you would have another conflict or dilemma to face, I guess, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is something that definitely also happens in the movie. Um, and um, maybe we can go to the next, uh to the next point in the in the presentation to discuss like i think i have the feeling like i'm going to bring up so many problems and it's just going to be more questions after we're done than we had before but i mean maybe that gets us into thinking i think it's this one yeah the journalist shall observe professional secrecy regarding the source of information obtained in confidence yeah i mean you heard it in the trailer like there was this one band, band member who said i'm telling secrets to the one guy you don't tell secrets to um, how do you think you would deal with, like, like, if somebody says this, how do you think Will in the movie, like, how should he deal with the information received after that? Does that mean anything? Or is it just, uh, just being, you know, it's not like he's saying, okay, this is off the record. I'm going to tell you a secret now. He's just saying, oh yeah, I'm being dumb. I'm just telling you something I shouldn't tell you, but what now? <laughs> 
I think that's why um, this is like related to the previous point, but I think this is why um, as a journalist from like an ethics point of view that we're talking now, I feel like you always have to be very clear about your intentions. And um, I'm a fan of declaring myself as a journalist whenever possible. And I think 99%, unless it's a very sensitive um, situation that you have to go undercover for public interest, I think there's really no barriers against declaring yourself because this is exactly what keeps these kind of situation from being a dilemma later on. Because if you be clear with about yourself up front, then whatever that guy tells you later on, it's on him in a way because they know that you're a journalist. And if they still choose to convey information in that way, then you have a little bit more power in um, using the information later on. I would like to pick up on that because I think you're making a very, very fair point. Um, but um, the sentence uh, that um, I, I'm telling you this and you're the only person who shouldn't um, uh, hear this basically, like as much as it um, um, is an expression of a sort of awareness of the uh, situation on a meta level, there's also a lot of vulnerability in it, right? It's just like, okay, I'm kind of desperate so, uh, which is like, okay, the awareness is there, but still, like, um, what's your obligation as a journalist? What, what would you think? Like, if someone says something like that to you, um, would you think it's ethical to basically quote what whatever comes after or whatever came before? Because there's a person who kind of, you know, like, emotionally gets naked or something and uh, how do you deal with that even though there is this like sort of disclaimer made by them even what would you do i think i would try i think well it depends on what the exactly i mean there are nuances in this but and i think i would if, if it's ex very very sensitive and you think they are putting themselves in a very unusually vulnerable position. I think as someone they trust, I would clarify with them when maybe af a little bit after the fact, like if, if to confirm if this is indeed, you know, what degree of um, sensitivity is this? and depends on the context like mm -hmm. how do you frame the conversation in a way that we can print it or something like what's yeah. the level you're comfortable with or something like that if it's yeah. related to safety or you know i don't know any number of things yeah yeah i think i would do the same but still like if for example in on a on an aside maybe that person then says like well I don't even write my own songs. Like, uh, I, don't, I don't know, I employ like a ghostwriter for my songs. And it really doesn't have anything to do with what they're talking about primarily in that situation, for example. Like, you know, I'm just, I'm just making up like very, very hard dilemmas for, for you to answer to because I, I wouldn't know how to answer this uh, either. But like, uh, yeah. for, for example, and that's obviously, if you, if you try to check later, then you have the problem that, well, maybe that person probably says like, well, no, none of this, please print it. But you you would think then, okay, if this person has uh, uh, admitted to not writing their own music, isn't that, for example, of public interest if it's like a number one sort of like rock band thingy, right? Well, but I think that's, that's, yeah, no, no, I think that's interesting because then, but then it gives you information to investigate with other people like even if you can't confirm with that person again you can start going around and like ask other people around and try to figure out not the story that way so yeah, i think I either think way you you have something to go on with maybe that's a very or, good point that you can like i think this even this is what you should always do with any fact i mean you don't only use one source you always use other sources to confirm and i think this is also a way if you have somebody who says you can't quote me on this or gives you some background information you can still take this information and go to somebody else and say i heard without like clarifying who you heard it from you can just confirm with other people and then find a way to to get this into your piece i think that's a good point jamie just made uh sorry gustavo do you want to did you say no i just want to mention that if you this is so, just 
just a crazy a crazy thing but if you think that you have an information that is the of public interest what do you think of publish it anonymously if you if, if you if you uh, are aren't pursuing the uh, uh, the money or or you don't want to getting into a struggle with the artist with the label with your with your with your magazine what do you think what do, what do you think of, of public of publish it in, in not in the in the main in the main in the main piece what do you think of public of public it what do you think of anonymously for me is today for today is is a tool you mean like like whistleblowing in a way in a, <laughs> to other magazines or did, I, I don't know if i got that right Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a tricky one. Um, I mean, I think from a journalistic standpoint, that is definitely unethical, um, I would say. But I mean, we have this power now, obviously, like every person basically has this power to like, you know, publish information mostly anonymously. And uh, in some cases that is, well, obviously, um, uh, well, um, that is very reasonable and and very important, you know. Like if you talk about like politically a political whistleblowing and 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 all of that. But I mean, first off, I think I think you would fall. It, it would it would super backfire on you because the people who are you who uh, you are reporting on know who you are, right? And uh, second, secondly, I think yeah, well, it would be less believable um, if there's no byline, basically, if there's if there's no name attached to it. And uh, then it would border on hearsay, and uh, still, um, yeah, I think, I think, I think, in many ways, you would kind of maybe uh, transgress certain ethical boundaries um, uh, that are also laid out in this uh, charter that uh, Laura has, has showing has been showing us so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so too. Um, you should maybe stick to the to the usual way to go of publishing it the way it was. Uh, was also like said in the beginning, I mean, you make some agreement with the artist and say, okay, we're going to write the story for this in this magazine, like everything should be transparent. Um, I would like to, to ask another question. Uh, if we think about those um, uh, information obtained in confidence, um, or maybe even like private information um, in the movie, there's the situation that the band is on tour and they are having like all those women around and there are some affairs with the other younger women and all that. And um, and then one of the artists says, one of some of us have wives at home and um, it puts him also like the journalist in the dilemma, like how does he, how do we also distinguish between the real person, the, the artist is in his real life, so to speak, and the, the artist persona that we sometimes uh, sometimes have with, especially with, uh, with bigger artists, I guess. And also, do you have a responsibility towards the people acquainted to the artists, like family members? Like, do you have to protect their privacy as well? Like, this is maybe also a question to consider. Or maybe just a thought, okay, maybe we could just keep that in mind. It's not really a question, it's more like something that you should also have in mind. Like they are, of course, artists and they are public personas, but also they have a, maybe have a real life that needs to be protected and um, this is something that we should also not forget. One question I think is really um, like I, I wonder um, how do we deal with when you witness illegal actions taking place like for example on the tour they are doing acid like is the reporter allowed to, to report on illegal drug abuse in a way that's happening? What do you think about that? For example in Latin America, Gustavo Adrián Cerati Clark, ex former vocalist of Soda Stereo, I don't know in, if out of America the people know about this band, it's one of the most bigger bands in Latin America. If they were English, for sure they will be more bigger than the Beatles, but they they born here in Argentina, well, in Argentina. So, but well, Gustavo Cerati, uh, after being the vocalist of, of Soda Stereo, went into a solist career, and he, uh, yeah, he 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 went to into another lifestyle, more more craziest lifestyle. I don't know if you know, but he spends his last years of life in a bell, in a coma state because an overdose, uh, an, an overdose uh, induction, 
uh, after a concert in Venezuela. And, uh, and, and that's why I, 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 I mentioned the anonymous thing because nobody, no, no, no one uh, magazine or, or, or no one press, specialized press, no one talk why Gustavo Cerati went into a coma state for a year. No, no one talk about it. The one uh, point of information that you can find in, in internet or, or at least in the first 10 pages of, of Google is a blog spot, a blog spot of a guy, not a professional journalist who was in the Armando Records, a bar in Bogotá, in, in, in Colombia. And, and he, from a distance, were watching what, what Gustavo Cerati was, was doing, you know? And he, 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 he I don't know, he talked talk a little bit with him. He never, he never, he was not recording anything. He was not uh, reporting anything, but the day after that, uh, that, that night in, 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 in Colombia, Gustavo Cerati continue, con, will continue, the, the idea was continue the, the tour, but he, he wasn't able to, to, to get into the plane because he, he, he get down. So after that, he get, get into a bed for, for his last years in coma and nobody tells why. So for me, for me, for me, as a fan of Gustavo Cerati, as a fan of Soda Stereo, as a fan of the music in Latin America, as a fan of the myths, as a fan of the legends, for me, it's important to know that, you know, and, and, and for me, I don't, I don't, for me, it's not important if, it's, if it is, if it, if it is said by this whole uh, name in the period in the, in the music journalism industry. For me, it's important to someone talk about it because now when you publish something, it, 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 it became a part of the uh, of a digital archaeology. So it, it, it's a question to the person who finds the article the, the, to question if it is real, if it is veridic, if it is uh, uh, Util or, or or not, I mean, our vision as a, as a periodist is, is to put it into the light, and is there is there and are the readers who 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 judged it who judged it? So I don't know. I I, I don't know. I I, I I think that you are you are you, it's 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 an illegal situation if you mm -hmm. public something anonymously, but. If 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 some if, if if so many people were published, a lot of things that mm. for not being allowed to publish were will be I don't know another um, one. I want to I want to shortly interrupt because this is very very important and this is uh, this is a very good example of of where this all of this may lead to. Uh, Nicolas Beldi uh, writes on YouTube that um, um, Gustavo Serrati uh, didn't have an overdose; he had a stroke. So have you just publicly been spreading false information, Gustavo? Ask yourself. No, he 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 don't get into a, he he don't die by, by an overdose. By he went into a coma state by by I don't I am not saying that about mm -hmm. that they consume drugs. And you can you can re release the 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 record and I am never say that Gustavo Cerati was consuming drugs. I I just say I'm not gonna that sue he you. was huh? <laughs> we're not gonna sue you. <laughs> you don't know, but I was I was saying that he spent his last night in the Armando Records in Bogota and then to continue his tour he can't get into the plane because because he 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 went to the floor. He went to the floor you can find it. Gustavo Cerati don't die by an overdose by but but he spent his last his last night uh, not in his normal life in in, in the Armando Records in Bogota, mm -hmm. and I I don't know what he was doing that night, but yeah. something do that 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 and to the to the next day he went to the floor, and I'm not saying that, 
No, yeah, yeah, no, no, it's fine. Don't I think worry. No, nobody's accusing you of this, but 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 I just thought yeah. it was a brilliant example of how like stuff that is based on hearsay and um uh, you know like um uh, is always problematic because mm -hmm. like you have a certain narrative that you form around it and someone comes up with like a, a different narrative that just challenges yours and where do I as a sort of consumer who doesn't know um Gustavo Cerati like what do I do with like those two types of conflicting information right yeah and especially if, if you say like you have 10 pages of google where there's nothing and then you have one article that says so I would be also be very critical if you have just one source that doesn't even have any proof really like it's, it's just just to keep that in mind that we need more than one source and maybe there's a reason for official publications not including it which brings me actually to the next um to the next sheet of the presentation to the next point um do you have it sorry <laughs> Yeah, next one. So the journalist will respect privacy. He or she shall respect the dignity of the persons named and or represented and inform the interviewee whether the conversation and other material is intended for publication. He or she shall show particular consideration to inexperienced and vulnerable interviewees. I mean, this is not the case with the um, person you just mentioned, Gustavo, because they are obviously very experienced and all that. But I think this point of, of privacy um, and considering whether it's dignified to have this in a public space. Like, as I said, like it, you think about the persons behind them, if this was your father, would you really want information like this to be in the public? Like these, those are like the things that you need to consider. I just want to get into another point here, um, this point of vulnerable interviewees, like the, what uh, Christopher has already mentioned. I mean, it's, it's usually or, or oftentimes um, when we talk to, to young artists, to inexperienced artists and independent artists who don't have a, like a professional PR behind them, they are in a way vulnerable. Um, and also I think Ilgas was the kindest to send in um, a question beforehand or some questions. Um, if we think about marginalized people in general, do you think there are other ethical standards that apply here? Did you get, like, like, was it clear the question? <laughs> Sorry, just uh, if you don't, don't understand my question, just let me know. It's just sometimes I, I tend to ask five questions at the same time, so that's why. <laughs> Excuse me if I sound vandalistic, but which is private and which is public? If you are a racist, that is in your, in your private space, that is public interest. Excuse me, because if you are a, a a sexist, if you are a machist, if you are a, a misanthropic person in your private space, you are a, 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 I don't know how to say, yeah, yeah. you are a bomb to the people outside. You are, you are, you are dangerous to the people outside. Excuse me, but yeah, 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 sure. So I mean, that's that uh, things, that things are where, where is the private and where is the public? Where is the line in that? In that? Uh, well, but I, I think I think I think I think you're working with very, very obvious examples here, um, uh, because obviously if someone is like has racist views and they're really racist views and not just like, I don't know, like stupid stuff that they're saying that is racist. Like if someone is really racist, then obviously that makes it a matter of public interest. But what, for example, if someone says like, okay, I'm bipolar in an interview situation, I, I, I suffer from like a, a psychological condition in some kind of way. And um, um, is that interesting? Maybe yes. Um, also for the general public, because it would explain perhaps like some erratic behavior or something uh, for people who follow that person's music. But um, isn't that also too private? Like that's more sort of the situation that maybe we can talk about, and maybe we can we can talk about also is like yeah, like uh, marginalized people like who um, um, suffer from like like a matrix of like oppression or, or something, but like maybe like step over the line when they say something. Like, do they deserve maybe also more protection than you know just your regular? I don't know, like. Uh, 
white guy, basically, you know, and um, I think that I think that's a very interesting question because um, 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 because also there, like, it's really, really hard to, to, to give a very general answer. Um, but yeah. Yeah, uh, I asked that question uh, especially because I felt like uh, sometimes uh, not just journalists, also for example, academia, kind of, you know, this like information that is gathered is sometimes used in a way, I feel like it's sometimes exploitation, you know, like it's like used as for public interest, but does it really benefit people or the communities? Um, and I asked this particularly because I was thinking, okay, I'm like writing a piece, talking to people from marginalized com communities. I'm like making maybe a, car a career out of it, like becoming successful and the publications are getting successful. And what are these people getting, you know? this kind of thing and they're giving like their time uh the information that is like kind of experience information that is very valuable so um, i was yeah that's why i was a bit shy sometimes to approach people um, mm -hmm. because i've also seen like many examples where the information is used in a weird context sometimes like sensationalized Mm, that's why I was also thinking about the uh, material exchange, kind of like yeah. for um, more like academic pieces that I'm writing. I, for example, thought of is if it would be okay to pay people to because they're giving me their time, the experience, the information kind of like this kind of inequalities between also the journalists and the interviewees kind of, I think it's also uh, when we are talking about the relationships and how we uh, like how we keep the secrecy or the personal information, et cetera, for interviewees, it's also important to think, okay, what is my position? Who am I for what publication I'm working and who are these people like, also if they're like inexperienced with um such interactions etc etc i think it's very yeah crucial yeah it's a super yeah. super complex um issue because I, I totally get what what you're trying like like what you mean like be we going in there in a way exploiting those communities for our own benefit and selling their stories but what do they get out of it it's yeah it's, it's steph do you have a have an opinion on yeah. that or yeah, yeah, because I think it's a tricky question because we are human after all, as we talked uh, days ago. So maybe I think we can keep a secret as long as it is, doesn't harm another person or disrespect another group of people because maybe the artists want to tell you something about um, their mom or transition as a trans people. And this is a very personal thing. So maybe get to know better as an artist, as a, as a person. And I think you can keep that secret for you. And now you can keep more attention about their lyrics or their music or something like that. And in another hand, I think if at some point, if you see that they are hurting a girl or a boy or something that it's not correct, you have to act in that moment and say, no, I'm here only I'm a journalist, I'm a person and this is not okay. So I will record an, in a video and say no and protect the person in, who is being hurting. So I think it's critical and, and you can say, you can see these two points. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, but I think what like this one content that you just made about like paying your the people you interview, I think this is really dangerous in a way. I mean, I get why you would want to do it because you want to give back. I mean, imagine like if you, I mean, if you interview like, for example, a homeless person and you're paying their coffee or you're giving them a meal or something like just to spend the time, I think, I think there's a, there's a line between what is okay that you can pay for lunch or that you can pay for the drinks or whatever. I think that's fine. But I mean, actually going out to pay somebody to talk to you gets put you in a very weird like in a like makes you a little, you know like i'm just having difficulty phrasing this now but you know like like your own integrity could be at risk even if you mean well i i don't know if i would do it actually 
even yeah. if I get the idea behind it. It just creates a sort of economic hierarchy in, in that moment and it and it leads to more conflicts of interests, obviously, because then if a person is paid to tell you something, will they, I don't know, maybe go further? Will they try to like satisfy your needs? So you create like a more artificial situation. But at the same time, of course, I get it. Like I always feel bad because I'm I'm basically just paying uh, my interview subjects uh, in exposure coins, and uh, we all know what we get for for, for, for ex exposure coins at the, at the at the nearest supermarket, right? Very little, and uh, that's definitely I think that's a fundamental issue. And but it's but it's really hard to solve, kind of. Um, it makes me also think about um, um, there's like some ethic guidelines for documentaries, for example, especially when it comes to going into war zones or or stuff like that. And one of those like more dogmatic um, uh, set of rules says that you should not at, in any case intervene. But what do you do if you're, you know, like see, I don't know, like like a, like a, someone basically dying and there's no one else there to help? Like, do you just like hold the, ca hold, put the camera on them and just like film them dying? No, you would try to intervene, of course. Um, so it's, you know, like, which is a very extreme example and luckily we don't have to deal with that in, in music journalism but um, I think um, um, I think that like such cases of like okay how can I actually like also or how should I have an impact on on the the, the scene that I'm reporting on in my role as a music journalist when I'm in a situation where I'm first and foremost a music journalist is incredibly difficult to sort of navigate um, and um, yeah, I think that's also not a very uh, satisfying answer, though. But um, I totally get the dilemma. But um, to be honest, uh, yeah, I I, th I think I try to not. I don't know. I wouldn't want to pay anyone. I think it's different in academia, for example. Like you would pay someone to take uh, to take a part in a medical um, um, experiment of some sorts or test study or something. So I think you can justify that a lot better. But maybe I would try to, I don't know, maybe do that afterwards. I don't know. Sorry. Yeah, oh. just, just an example came to my mind, actually, where we have, where I had experience with, uh, with this dilemma because I was, uh, I was at journalism school here in Berlin at the very big um, academy, like a very big publishing house. And we did a podcast on, on the Syrian, like the war in Syria. And we had this family, like there was this little boy, he was our protagonist. And we kind of, like, we had lengthy, like he gave him, a, like we had interviews via um, a reporter that was there and like um, going with him to school and doing a podcast about him and his family and his experience being a child in the war, which was actually really horrible, but also like very um, amazing view into the situation. And then we were thinking when it was over, like when the project was done, we were also like having in this position, like we want to give them something back for them having given us their story and um, then the publisher decided actually to donate to the school, like there was a public school in the in the village where he was living and they were giving like they were do um, collecting donations and gave the school some heating system or something and some books and stuff and we were transparent about that like we we posted this with the like on the website and um i don't really feel that was a bad thing to do i mean we didn't buy them in a way i think it's just just showing that we respect their effort they have put in us so i think there's yeah, if there's money and if, like, I think, I think it shouldn't be on you personally, but I think if you are working for a big publishing house and they decide, yeah, we, with our compliance issues, we can donate as, as a publisher, as something like as an institution, I think that's a better way to go than saying, I will give you 50 euros. You know, I think this is maybe protects you and um, still gets you out of this conflict, maybe. Yeah, I think that's a great solution. I like really and yeah. it's also an intervention also in the you know the structures uh, yeah yeah you should maybe just just mm -hmm. be safe that it's not on you personally because you yeah. also have to mm -hmm. protect your reputation i mean your yeah, good name exactly. is is all you have so yeah mm -hmm. maybe that's that's an idea um maybe we can go to the next because i see times flying already <laughs> we can go to the next um point So yeah, this one. The journalist shall not use the freedom of the press to serve any other interests and shall refra refrain from receiving unfair advantage 
or personal gain because of the dissemination or non-dissemination of information. He or she will avoid or put an end to any situation that could lead him or her to a conflict of interest in the exercise of his or her profession. He or she will avoid any confusion between his activity and that of advertising or propaganda. He or she will refrain from any form of insider trading and market manipulation. Um, what I found really um, especially interesting here was this putting an end to any situation that could lead to a conflict of interest, like when it comes to money. And then you, if you think about the trailer again, um, Lester Banks was saying they're going to fly you places for free. Like, how do you deal if the band or if the label pays for your trip? Like, if they pay you, because obviously you will not be able to be paid by a small publication. Um, yeah, how would you, do you think this could have an impact? Should you disclaim this in your, in your work? Like, where do we, how do we communicate this? I mean, I think it's more of a personal thing that like, I mean, nowadays you won't have people flying you to places, but you still have people being nice to you because you're a journalist. And you, you're able to see that they're being nice to you because you're a journalist. You know, so it's like, it's more of a personal thing. Like, I don't have to say no to them being nice, but I have to be sort of objective about it that, okay, you know, that's separate. And, you know, they're nice, just separate. And I mean, you just got to be objective about it. Like, pretend they were not being nice, I guess, and, and just being neutral, I guess. Yeah, which is hard though, especially, especially if, um, I remember this one time I was flown to London uh, to uh, watch a, a concert in Wembley Arena. And before that, the PR person took me out for dinner in, an, in a fancy Italian restaurant, you know, and and then paid the cab back to, to the hotel that was booked for me, you know? And I mean, all of this for an article for which I received like 50 euros or something in the end, you know? And um, I mean, like, you know, like that PR person was super nice, like used to do, used to work with Kraftwerk and, and, and whatnot. It was just like very, very interesting. And what I, I think in that, in that particular um, um, situation, it didn't really, um, influence my reporting so much because I just wrote for this like a little bit like more I'm um, you know like uh, for an indie publication and they kind of knew it was just like we, we would approach it like in a certain way and like you know like that it wasn't necessarily affirmative but just more like it was like this like Japanese teenage girl metal band um, baby metal they're called very good by the way um, I'm not saying that because I've, 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 I've had a very good <laughs> I was just gonna ask. Um, but, um, so, um, they kind of knew that we would maybe like more intellectualize it and look at it as a phenomenon, uh, rather than, you know, like, just like, this is your usual, like, band feature or whatever. So it was all fine and dandy, but it was like a very, very weird situation, which I thought like, oh my God, like, just, I'm here and I'm piss poor basically and i'm you know like all of this is happening around me and, and someone just like puts like a credit card on the table and pays for all of this like that was really bizarre but yeah. did you put it in the article like do you think no. there should be a, no but you know for for transparency like are we obliged no. to tell our audience that this has uh, happened like how this is financed that's something that that i that i proposed yesterday for yeah. exactly that reason it didn't. It didn't really influence anything on on what I did. Um, um, I, I would say, um, even, even though I just pointed out that it's a very good band, which it is. It was fun, um, but nonetheless, um, um, I think that's something that should be pointed out, uh, which is why I, I, I suggested it yesterday in my proposed um, uh, code of ethics for 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 for. Um, um, uh, music publications, because I think like a lot of that kind of stuff is never really spoken about, and um, it, it always comes with an economic ob obligation. Obviously, yes. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, uh, besides economic obligation, we've uh, like in the movie also. There's another point where the uh, artist is saying to William, "Just make us look cool," like really saying, "Please do this for us. This is really important for us." Like putting him under a kind of a emotional pressure even like how how can we deal with that or not deal at all hopefully but um 
Yeah, I mean, there's, there's also this kind of interpersonal thing that happens if you are with somebody for a longer time. I think if you are with them for a couple of days and as it was said in the trailer, don't make friends with the rock stars. But in the end, all of us want to be friends with the rock stars. Like, how do we, how do we, yeah. Like, it's, it's also, that's also kind of a difficult uh, thing that arises when you are, um, when you are spending time with people. Okay. Um, yeah, let's switch to the last of the, um, of the uh, spreadsheets on the ethics charter. Because now I want to get uh, yeah, to a point that's been mentioned before. So uh, just reading it, um, the journalist will not undertake any activity or engage likely to put his or her in independence in danger. He or she will, however, respect the methods of collect uh, collection and dissemination of information that she um, or he has freely accepted, such as off the record, anonymity or embargo, provided that these commitments are clear and unquestionable. Um, so yeah, here we go. I mean, I want to go into this um, the thing of, of authorizing quotes because I think um, it has come up uh, several times, like how we deal with it. Like, what do you think? Is it mandatory to have quotes, direct quotes authorized? Um, and what is it with uh, indirect speech and thing that's just indirectly quoted? How do you deal with that yourself? Or maybe how is it done at the publication you've worked for? I mean, it's, it's like, I guess it's different wherever you work. Like it's every house has their own policy in a way. I mean, direct quotes, obviously, you got to have, you got to have record of it somehow, like recording, obviously, because if it comes into dispute, dispute, you need to be able to prove that, yes, this was said. It hasn't come to a point ever in my experience, at least where it has to come down to bit, you finding witnesses who can corroborate what you're saying in there. But uh, for and then for indirect ones, obviously, like oftentimes it will be thrown around like, you know, your own perspective as a journalist is going to color your view of what's happening. Mm -hmm. So like that's go going to happen. And again, it comes down to the same thing that was said earlier, way early in the workshop. It's like, uh, you know, if it gets disputed, if you have some witnesses or something to uh, sort of uh, uh, Corroborate what you just uh, what you've written. Mm -hmm. and great. Otherwise, it's a dispute that's up in the air, and you know they can prove it as much as you can prove it in a way. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's that's the question uh, about the the on record off record thing. I'm gonna get to that in a bit. But I was thinking about authorizing, like sending people quotes before you publish. Like, how do you deal with like if if it's requested, or do you always do it? Do you think it's mandatory to send out um, parts of your piece? before like how do you usually do that in your work mm, i would probably do it i would probably send it out and but what like the direct quotes or everything mm, depends <laughs> probably if also the other parts of the article contains information uh, that might refer to the person that I was with, and yes, like the also uh, not just the quotes, but the other parts. Yeah, have you, have you ever done this? Like, has it ever ever been no, sent out the no. whole piece before? Yeah, no. because actually, I've like I have the feeling that this puts you in a lot of trouble if you do that. I wouldn't recommend doing that. Um, I mean, I, mean it's, I think it's like if you send out the direct quotes, that's I think this is something that people can request. I think that's then you have to give it to. Oh, hi, Christopher. <laughs> we just lost you. Or did you just go off the camera? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, uh, I think so. The, the direct quotes are definitely something that people can request. And then I think you are in a way obliged to send them out. But I would really be careful sending more than that because people, like, because if you say it contains information that, that refers back to the artist, of course, everything in your piece refers back to their information about themselves. And if you send this to a promoter or something, they will go over it and, and totally try to edit everything out. <laughs> I think that could happen. Yeah, um, someone brought that up in the YouTube chat as well. Um, uh, 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 
person called brought me here, which is probably the best uh, YouTube um, uh, uh, handle I've ever read. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, this makes me think of when PRs slash artists ask to check pieces before they go live, which always seems weird to me. Yes, because what happens then is they are unsatisfied with like stuff they've said personally or that the artist that they represent personally. And to give you one example, um, just recently, um, a booking agency uh, told me they uh, will uh, kind of draft a sort of like um, thing where they will outline that they will uh, need to check and be able to request and make edits on also not only Q&As, but also written articles, which um, I didn't respond to that email, um, but um, was just so weird to me um like that someone would basically tell me like yeah like um you will basically have to agree to this before you do anything with our artists um because then i'm thinking like well then i'm just your copywriter right and uh you can just make some edits um uh, however you please and i give you the right like why should i do this like you're not even paying me to, <laughs> to do this um but like this is a very extreme example, and uh, I think um, the intention there was that they also like uh, represent a lot of marginalized um, 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 artists, which is absolutely fair to then uh, try to um, create a sort of like, um, well, um, a security for those in order not to be represented in ways um, which uh, just, you know, like tokenizes them or just further um, um, uh, damages them in some 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 kind of way, you know. Uh, and I totally understand that, but um, then I'm like, well, but why do you need me even to write this article as a journalist, right? But were there any consequences? Were they saying like, if you don't agree, we're not going to do the interview or something? I guess so. I guess so. Like like I said, I, I didn't I didn't I didn't further like uh, uh, talk about this, but that was just like a very extreme example recently. I've come across and apart from that yeah like sometimes like after after you've done an interview with an artist they send you like a text message like oh by the way this one thing that I mentioned like can you please leave that out that happens often it also happens often that PR agencies will just write you an email afterward and be like hey yeah can we check over this like and and pretending that like it has always been clear that they have to read the whole thing and also have to really like say okay this this is fine and you need to change that where i'm like no sorry by 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 law i don't have to and uh, so i won't uh, please just trust me and yeah i think that's very important like just to stand your ground here because you actually don't have to do any of this like any like i think the only thing that you really have to do is like sending them direct quotes i think this is the right like but it's not like you don't have even don't have to offer it actually it's just if they ask can i please have my direct quotes afterwards you send them but actually as far as I know legally there's nothing else like even something like this like sending in a text message afterwards saying hey can we do this off the record this is not how off the record work it's not that you go oh I think I miss you know like like it's not editing out stupid things you said and like you should think about this in the first place and it's all just you being uh like moving making us like like being uh, also it's your own being nice actually or like being an, a nice person like editing it out in the end or giving them this kind of service but you're actually not obliged to do it and I think we should should also be able to say no to those kind of things yeah I mean sometimes it's kind of funny because like I'm, I'm thinking of a very, very specific example where I actually like someone like got in touch with me afterwards I was like oh please can you not print this and I was like, I wasn't, but now I'm reconsidering if I maybe should, if it's so controversial in your opinion. Um, but yeah, like because I was, I was just like, I was just like, okay, yeah, like that was like not in, like not an interesting part of the conversation. I'm just gonna edit this out. But that kind of made me think maybe it was. <laughs> yeah, maybe I wanna. Hey, uh... can you guys hear me? What? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, sorry, I'm traveling, but I wanted to jump in really quick with a situation that just just happened to me, maybe get your opinion, in which I inter interviewed like an individual artist. Um, and they were just really, you know, at the time of the interview, I was like, you know, I'll send you a final draft before it goes to print. 
but after the interview and you know like a couple weeks goes by and they're like actually can you send it to me before you send it to the editor because I want to look over it and make sure I like it first and I was just kind of like no I'm not going to do that but it's kind of created like a personal rift between me and them and then one like and it kind of sounds like a similar situation in which I don't think I'm under any obligation to do that I think it was you know fair enough for me to send them the final draft before it went to print so if there were any like urgent corrections to make they could have made them but I I just should would you have sent the draft before you sent it to the editor to the individual artists? Uh, so yeah, no, it's, it's it's not your obligation, definitely not. And I think uh, yeah, that's just what you said. And um, if you feel like, like I don't know if I understood that right with some kind of a personal thing. Um, as I said to Ilgas, it's also always helpful if you say, okay, this is the policy, how it's done with our magazine and just referring it back to a kind of a house policy, then being like, I'm the individual person, I'm not going to give you this because they're going to take it personally. But if you just go to the next, like to the meta level and say, okay, I'm working here as well. And this is how it's done here. There's actually nothing to argue about. So that's, that's what I would do. Like just referring back to my boss, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Which is it's smart. Uh, which is which is why I would always uh, try to um, uh, talk with your editors about that kind of request uh, because they just have more leverage in that situation. And if they tell you, um, uh, like in writing, basically, no, you don't have to do that. You can just, or you shouldn't do that. Actually, which is why they should write in that in, the, in that sense. Uh, you can just forward that to the person and maybe get a little bit out of the line of fire. I would try that as a strategy in order to avoid the like very personal thing. Um, I know it's very, very tough, and I know it's especially tough if you are dealing with like interview subjects who are maybe like really like, I don't know, like inexper both inexperienced and um, um, very anxious about being covered and they really want to like, you know, like that not to be misunderstood, for example, like I've had like a lot of cases uh, where those kind of people like all this like people who were like that uh, wanted to like just look over it and um, um, but yeah, like apart from like direct quotes and 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 whatever, you're not really obliged to um, um, give them anything. And um, even if you do, if you choose to do it in order to like just make them feel more comfortable and more safe, uh, I would always um, send uh, like a sort of disclaimer and tell them, listen, you can maybe argue with me on stuff that you think is factually not correct. But um, um, everything that is basically um, reflects my opinion as a writer or whatever, or that you've actually said on record, will just stay it as it is. So I would I would try to establish nicely, of course, um, some ground rules before you send anything over. And like I said, go to the editors, ask them. Best way to go. <laughs> Thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks for the input. Um, yeah, because I, I think it's uh, like I have two more um, more sheets on this thing with uh, on the record and off the record. Maybe I just want to want to add some uh, thing. I, I've, I've done some research on it. And uh, generally speaking, every interview, if not otherwise specified, is on the record and can be used and quoted. This is something like we should be really aware of and that everybody should be aware of them when they are talking to us. And as I said, off the record is kind of a tricky one because um, it's it actually it's, it's up to interpretation it means a lot of different things to different people but in generally the terms it just means nothing of the conversation can be used if it is agreed upon in advance so they have really have to say this is the next one is off the record da 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 da, da. now we're on the record again like and then they are safe but apart from that actually legally there's no, no other um yeah, other deal around that. Like, it's not like, as I just point out, put out, like you can't be afterwards, oh, that was actually off the record without it being said in advance. That's not how this works. Um, and also there's, um, as I was pointing out before, the thing with on background, like this is also kind of a mode you can go to, like have a background interview, which basically means that journalists can use the information provided, but must in any way protect the identity of the source. And um, still you can, like this also has to be agreed upon in advance. Like it cannot be that afterwards they say, oh, this was just a background interview and I didn't mean this as a real interview. Like this is just something that needs to be very clear in the beginning. And actually, yeah, you are pretty safe when it comes to that to say. Um, 
because I had the feeling that now we feel like off the record, this seems like a way for, for sources to get out of their responsibility. Actually, it's also something that serves us as journalists. Um, so if you could, maybe I have one quote from an editor that I found, like it's also very interesting to change this perspective because it seems to be working against us. But actually, um, I found that quote very interesting when she says, off the record is criticized by some because it allows attacks to be made without accountability. Yet to most reported, it is, a, it is an essential part of freedom of speech. It affords anonymity to sources to expose wrongdoing and question those in power without the fear of recremation. Political journalists use lobby rules whereby private conversation, including those of a lunch, are honored by the off-record agreement. So it's actually also like a very important tool for us to gather information. I was just wanted to include this just as a change of perspective that it also serves our research in obtaining information by people who have to stay anonymous. And uh, maybe you could just go to the next slide immediately because I really like this one. This is by the editor in chief of the New York Times. And he says, I don't go off the rule with high ranking officials at all, ever particularly the president. As the person overseeing coverage, I don't think officials should be able to tell me anything that I can't publish. And I mean, this is the editor-in-chief of the New York Times. So, you know, like you don't have to agree to those kind of things. Like you have rights as a journalist and um, it's like, like you, yeah. I just wanted to make that clear that you can also stand your ground and uh, don't have to be, yeah, intimidated by some kind of those kind of things. Um, so, yeah, but of course, this is with media professionals like the president, as it is said in this, uh, in this quote, and um, we rarely get to interview the president, um, but as I was hinting before, often persons that are not so experienced with, um, yeah, with media, and um, this brings me to the story. I promised you that I would tell you <laughs> about my experience I had on this thing, so. Um, yeah, so as I was promised, it's the whole uh, this is the story of the first and uh, so far only shitstorm I have ever caused in my life um, with an article I wrote for Groove in 2017. I was a freelancer at the time um, and it was in a way my almost famous experience on a very small scale because I was supposed to go on tour with a German underground label and collective called Giegling. Um, they had been very popular at the time. Um, having been awarded label of the year on resident advisor in 2016. So that was the year before. And um, we were supposed to spend two days together. So I was able to see two shows, one in Leipzig and one in Berlin. And um, this was pretty special as they were not really very vocal in public um, and didn't do any social media stuff. Like they were just really, yeah, private in, in their kind of uh, public image. Um, and so getting behind the scenes of this collective seemed to be a very interesting story angle, obviously. Um, so they had a little gallery space in Berlin at the time, and I met up with Konstantin, who was the head of the collective, so to speak, in advance for an interview before we went on tour, which was really nice. It was just a regular, like, getting to know each other, getting a little bit of an idea of the, um, of the whole collective thing and stuff. And um, it was kind of a, yeah, talking before we were actually going on tour. And the next morning we met um, with him and with uh, some other people from the collective at the station in Berlin to take the train to Leipzig for the show. So I just got to know them. We were on the train chatting, talking, and I was yeah taking notes like we saw Will do in the story because I was like starting to, to catch the vibe of this because I was going to write a reportage on how they interact and stuff. Like yeah, just taking in all of that. And um, yeah, it was really, really a chilled vibe and we were just chatting as I said, and then Constantin asked me about some other publications I wrote for and um, what my topics were besides music, basically like doing small talk and stuff. And I said, pop culture and feminism. And then he raised his eyebrow and um, yeah, without asking me for it, started going uh, into a lengthy talk on, on yeah, how he's obviously not a feminist and how he was, uh, yeah, how he thought, like he had some really weird views on how women were uh, disproportionately promoted at the moment and how it was therefore so much easier for them to become popular DJs even if they are not as talented as their male counterparts and I was starting like I was of course because I'm, I'm really uh, yeah those are my kind of topics I write about and so I was like really like getting into an argument for a little while trying to explain like structural institutional and concealed discrimination and all those kind of things um, 
but actually he just went on and justified his views with some pseudoscientific references uh, on men's natural aspiration to power and their inherent need for recognitions. And it, yeah, it was all like really weird kind of views on this kind of things. And I was really shocked actually to say the least. I mean, we have to, to keep in mind that this was like an hour of going into the, the whole two days basically. So this was like the very beginning and I, and I thought, okay, I have to spend like two more days with them. So I'm not gonna get into like a real discussion anymore. So I was really trying to change the subject, but um, yeah, took notes and it wrote everything down. Um, and then I was like, yeah, it was, it was really weird. And then the next couple of days I approached two of other members of this collective to find out if they knew about this kind of views and what they thought about this because they are like from a very academic left wing background. So I was really surprised to see this um, in this kind of context. And um, yeah, they, they knew about this obviously. And they assured me that this uh, was an isolated viewpoint, um, but they knew about that he says stuff like this sometimes, um, but were kind of reassuring me that it had nothing to do with the views of the labels and stuff like that. They were kind of distancing themselves from those kind of views, but nevertheless knew that this is what he sometimes says. Yeah, and um, then the tour was over after two days. It was actually like the rest of the time was fine. Like I spent like about two days and we looked at the shows the music was really good and people were really nice to me and all that. But um, yeah, I had a, like I went back and I had a lengthy discussion with uh, the editorial team of Proof at the time, which was uh, yeah, not Alexis, but Tycho. Um, and then we were really discussing like, okay, there was this one incident, but should we include this in the piece? or not, like, because it's just one person from a collective of about, I don't know, 10 people or so, or maybe almost 10 people. Yeah, what do you think? Like, what would you have done? Like, how, how would you have reacted? I'd be interested in that, really. <laughs> no comments. <laughs> um, maybe. Yeah, I guess I would also go public with this. I yeah. mean, they were also responsible, even if it was one person, they knew it. They were apparently tolerating it. So, yeah. I don't know. I also wouldn't want to protect them so much, probably. <laughs> yeah, that was kind of the dilemma I was in. I was like, okay, I really like them and they are like, they were really nice. Like, a bit, you know, like it was this kind of a personal thing and I really loved the music that they make. And I thought, okay, is this really re relevant for the story? But at the other hand, can I really write a positive piece on somebody who has views like that? Like it was really, yeah, I was really struggling with this question. Um, yeah, but in the end um, we decided um, to, to put it in because I think I, because I was sure that I, I didn't want to leave it out and everybody agreed. Um, and yeah, it was, was the thing of like public interest in a way that I was considering, like, I mean, they are not, uh, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, like they were really popular, as I said, and, and I think, yeah, we shouldn't, like, I was really convinced that we shouldn't stay silent about something like this. Um, so I put it in uh, into the piece, but I didn't like maybe I can you can I can send you the link later to how I put it in. So I didn't sensationalize it. I didn't put it in the in the headline or something. Like it was not the core of my story. It was more like two paragraphs where I recalled the incident and also um, talked about how I talked to those uh, two other members um, of the collective who had distanced themselves from the artist. And um, so yeah, it was just basically two paragraphs in the otherwise pretty regular feature I'd say um, yeah and I mean what followed was in a way foreseeable but for us as a very small magazine was still the feedback was pretty overwhelming um, you can maybe put on the next sheet if you want I mean it's, it's just to, to illustrate uh, basically um, yeah the German as well as international magazines and daily newspapers were were picking up on it and uh, Twitter in a way exploded the, the blessed Madonna and this woman and other female artists came forward and luckily for us confirmed um, that they had similar experience um, with said artists. Um, so there was some public uproar, but um, luckily people were stepping forward and saying, yes, I, I can confirm I've, uh, I've seen this happen as well. And um, in a way it sparked a 
yeah, it sparked the long overdue discussion on, on gender inequality. I mean, you wouldn't say it sparked it, but it, it kind of fed into this discussion that was going on. Um, and yeah, this is why I still to this day think it was the right thing to do. Um, because I felt like we have the duty to our readers um, to share knowledge like this, but also bring the discourse forward. Um, but still, of course, you, you consider like you also have a responsibility for the artists. And I think this is what always happens, like when people say, okay, this is call out kind of culture um, and people will get canceled. Um, yeah, generally speaking, I was also like, if we think about vulnerability here, as we talked before, generally speaking, one could argue that they are not media professionals, they are not politicians. And obviously there wasn't a PR person on tour with us, like they don't have a, have a professional like that. But that's kind of also the thing of their collective. They are really like, like DIY in a way. And so they don't have those kind of structures. Um, and uh, this also became evident in the way it was handled afterwards by the collective themselves. And I just want to, to uh, yeah, it's just a statement. So basically resident advisor approached them and asked for a statement. And this is what, what he's, he said, I think it was after two days or so. Yeah, I think um, this is also like, I'm, I'm just, I'm not, not trying to like to, to make a point or something, but I think this is kind of a mechanism that we see happening quite often. Um, and that is also can become dangerous for you um, because there we have it, like it's this, it was said in a private conversation. So basically saying it was off the record, but I never had a private conversation with him ever. Like I met for an interview and then I went on tour with him. And I think this is kind of, um, this on the one hand and then yeah she didn't really get my bad sense of humor that's also kind of a mechanism that some, that often happens and um, these are kind of strategies to weaken your credibility in a way and to question um, your work ethic I think also I don't know if you agree but I feel like this is something that mostly happens when articles are written by women or by merchandise peoples that I don't know you feel like they are questioned like is that they do their job right did they uh, not get the joke maybe and um yeah actually it could have fired back at me um like it did i think christopher mentioned this morrissey incident D didn't you talk about that earlier um yeah, yeah when ben morrissey was saying some really racist things in an interview and was quoted on that and then the female journalist who interviewed him was actually forced by the public to uh to show her like like the audio recording she had of it, like she was really put in question and she was really, like people were really going really hard on her um, in that, I, I would say. And uh, that luckily didn't happen to me. Um, but, uh, 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 where am I? Yeah, and actually by, by publishing the statement, I was also kind of lucky that he, he didn't just say, I deny that I ever said that, but by publishing the statement, he was confirming that the conversation had actually happened the way it had, because uh, yeah, that's, that's also something. Um, I mean, if he had denied it, I don't know how things would have gone actually. Like, yeah, it was really like, there was so much stuff going on. And at the end of the day, as I said, like all you have is your good name. And you're, if you are in this position as a freelancer, as I was at the time, um, you also ruin. You can also ruin your own um, reputation by this. So it's also kind of a dangerous thing to consider: do you publish it or not? Um, because there are a lot of yeah power structures um, in place here. So um, even though there was a lot of backlash against the artist, um, there were also people who claimed that this call out culture would lead to a cancel culture, as I said, uh, which is also like a thing that's been been very present recently. I have the feeling. Um, and claiming that this would ruin his career. And um, I mean, some people posted pictures of them throwing away 
records of the label and a petition was launched to drop him from Amsterdam dance event. Uh, he actually got dropped from some festivals and for some clubs lineup. But um, yeah, that also put me in a, in a conflict where I thought, am I responsible for this? Did I, did I ruin his career? Did I ruin anybody's life? Um, I don't know, how do you feel about this responsibility? And in the end, what I find is, is also like the bigger question, are people ever really canceled? Like, is this really true? Like, is this uh, ruining somebody's career? I mean, we've seen it happen with other people who've said stuff and they still get bookings. Like, uh, maybe this is a question that we can close this, uh, this conversation with, like, or did I just leave it up to you? Like, is this really, is cancel culture really real or is it just something that, that doesn't actually end anybody's career? Before that, I would be interested in hearing from everyone. What do you think about running resident advisor running this statement? What do you think about that? Uh, I, I want to say actually, oh my god, sorry. <laughs> no, Jamie, go first, maybe. Go on, Jamie, go. Oh, uh, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. I was gonna ask about that. Um, and I think it also relates to our previous workshop about the role of resident advisor and platforms and all of that. But yeah, it's a little bit weird because um, you're not his PR. I mean, Ari is not his PR or Giggling's PR. And um, I actually don't know if that quote is just pulled from a bigger article or if it's no. contextualized in any way. If it's just a statement like that, it's a bit, um, it's a bit outside of... Uh, typical journalism i would say yeah, yeah exactly uh, so i um, i mean laura may may know or um, remember better but i but, but i think they just kind of framed it as like yeah well you know about the um accusations here's his statement and the statement was really really long and what he does in this statement is basically well he doesn't deny that it happened but first off he um um uh, kind of paints laura as someone who's just too stupid to understand his humor and uh, secondly, basically breached a sort of contract because uh, it was set in private, even though she was there like throughout this like whole time as a journalist and the two of them were not friends, very obviously. Um, so Resident Advisor posted this um, 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 letter, um, uh, like statement, and um, I thought it was um, highly unethical and um, I'm still very angry. So, which is why I probably stopped talking now, sorry. No, no, I think it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, like, it's weird for me to ask those kind of questions, so maybe it's good because I'm obviously in the very biased position. <laughs> yeah, it makes me angry too because I think it's just something that should be saying. As a collective, they protect each other of their height, of their... We can see how he still don't, doesn't accept what he did. And I think that making fun or something about woman or another person is never funny. How can you say that? So I think they should accept his wrong or something. It will be better. So and when we talk about cancel culture, cancel culture I always say is that we are, don't have six years to be canceling people, but I think, yes, we don't have six years. We are not talking about stolen sweets or, or, or stolen candies or something. We're talking about sexism, homophobia, or maybe talking about sex, sexual abuse. I think we need to talk about this more in music culture world. We have uh, our parties and rocks and a lot of and other stuff that we can stop talking about. So when also when people say uh, they ruin their careers, I think in Mexico City doesn't happen. Men keep winning awards and giving shows like nothing happens. So for me, you have to, to say what do you what do you see or where you hear about this. Yeah, I just think this is something that that's kind of always in a way shot at you as a journalist. Like, but be responsible. You're gonna ruin his career. You're gonna ruin his life. But I think, I mean, we've seen it with so many, especially male artists. They have their their friends and their supporters, and it rarely happens that somebody really gets cancelled. It's yeah, I think it's it's a very it's just to, to make you question question yourself in a way I mean of course you have to to be responsible and you have to uh, I mean obviously not go out and try to to cancel somebody just for for canceling them but still I think you shouldn't be intimidated 
by, by thinking about this because actually it's not, sadly, not so true. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that was my story. <laughs> that was really, um, yeah, it was really a weird time. And for me, especially like as I was starting out, um, it was really uh, significant, but I was still very glad how we handled it at Groove because all the editorial team was behind me. And that was also like, as I was saying before, like it's always important to circle back to your editorial team and to make decisions as a, as a whole and not being just yourself because I had the feeling like this gave me a lot of people in my bag. <laughs> That it's not just me, but the whole publication was was behind doing that. I think that's as a freelance writer, you still always have to, because people tend to just go out for this one person, but they actually work for a publication who was willing to print this, so they are responsible as well. So and yeah, I think this should be communicated in those kind of things. Yeah, do you have any questions, comments? We have twenty five more minutes, so please. Uh, yeah, I'll chime in and bring it back to resident advisor. Um, because uh, if you put up this, the number 13, lucky 13, to me, somehow, um, a lot of mainstream journalism actually is completely like the opposite of what this is saying. Uh, Chris said like the, the publishing of this apology is kind of unethical because they did use their press right or whatever to publish in order to uh, benefit some other, like like this this number 13, it's kind of funny to me because from what I can see, this is actually how things normally are, that people use their um, uh, uh, freedom of the press or the, this idea that they are good journalists and then take advertising money and this and that, just saying. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's, um, I mean, there's, it's, but it's also difficult. I mean, if you, if you think like they were a label of the year, the year before, and they were like, there was a lot of positive reporting and on them and like they were, yeah, I think that's also something that's, that's very difficult, like suddenly to report in this very different way. I mean, not, not that I'm justifying the statement, but it's, it's also something like, I wonder how those conversations were going back then. Yeah. I don't know. Well, it maybe is worth pointing out that uh, Geekling uh, was on tour. And do you have any idea where those tickets were sold? Um, okay. No. Uh, true. Yeah. No, no. I, per I personally don't know where, where they sold their tickets. Um, yeah. Anyhow, um, which platform did they use? No. Um, I, I to to basically to give you the editor's perspective. Um, I was the online editor, but this uh, was written for print, um, so I wasn't directly involved in the decision making process. I just I was informed that this was was would be included in the magazine and how um, uh, the rest of the team dealt with it. But it was still very very interesting um, because. Um, yeah, like I said, it came out in print and uh, the print magazine was sent out to the subscribers always one week before it hit the newsstands. So um, what happened is that we kind of, that especially I as an online editor, kind of prepared myself for the impact, but it came a little earlier than I expected because someone got, uh, some subscriber got a hold of the magazine and translated um, the crucial passage basically, but not all of it. Um, um, because, um, uh, like Laura mentioned earlier, um, she did the right thing and also asked other people from the collective, like, okay, like, has he ever said anything like this to you? Like, can you confirm that those are his views, you know, as any good journalist should do in this case? Um, but um, she wrote that also in the article, of course. But that was omitted from the translated version of that passage that was circulating. So uh, immediately, because I didn't want, you know, like all the major publications jump on it um, when it is not clear in that like briefed on author on uh, unauthorized translation um, that um, Laura actually did that job and got confirmation from other people around him, like and who were talking directly on the record, of course. Um, um, so I kind of like went on Twitter as a private person to tell everyone like please wait up before you do any reporting on this I know it's circulating but it's a not authorized and it's a b not the complete passage where well, I got suddenly attacked because people were thinking I'm trying to defend Constantine 
which was super super weird and um also also um it did reach um, um journalist uh, circles like some rather famous us um based journalist basically um also like um try to question this like yeah why so if he said it why why isn't that no direct quote for example which is how you can see that like you know like a lot of people like immediately think like okay if there's no direct road um it's not legit in some kind of way and um i think that's that was well it would have been fascinating if if, if it wouldn't have been so terrible and uh, i didn't i didn't sleep uh, a lot for 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 five days because um all hell broke loose and i didn't see it coming actually um but yeah um I think, yeah, like this question of like what's on the record, what's off the record, how do you quote things and can you quote things um, is so super important and that's something that you can really learn from this story uh, when it comes to how stuff like that is being uh, perceived by the audience or even by colleagues, you know, like it was really weird to see like some colleagues just questioning it because it was not at all like a sensationalizing article, uh, it was just like something that was, you know, like had one paragraph or two and, and the whole uh, scheme of things. But yeah. Oh yeah, I didn't know that. <laughs> That's interesting. Thanks for jumping in there. But I think you put it up uh, on, on online done pretty quickly, right? I think it was uh, on the on the website. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exact, exactly because we wanted to avoid like, um, you know, like um, the entire discussion being based around like this like translation, which was, it was not a bad translation, but it left out the crucial part where you give hard evidence um, and, uh, you know, and like the, the fact that I just tried to point out like, oh, please wait, it's not, it's not the complete thing. And I, I got attacked for it, uh, for allegedly, like it, that still doesn't really compute in my head, uh, even three years later, you know? So, but anyhow, um, yeah, no, it was, it was a very, very uh, interesting time to say the least. And you learned a lot about, um, I think, um, yeah, well, how these things are being treated by uh, other media, uh, but also by just fans, by, by PR people, by DJs. Um, because what happened as well is, yeah, like a lot of DJs came forward. And um, we also had heard through hearsay a lot of people already saying stuff. Like I remember like someone who used to work with him, like a woman like said, like he said the exact same things to me while I was working under him. So, you know, like that was definitely the kind of the obligation was there, like the public interest, like the matter of public interest was there. There were DJs also claiming on Twitter back then that he basically tried, refused to play on the same lineup as like certain uh, female DJs and uh, all that kind of stuff. So it was absolutely legitimate to run this story. And we did and um, unregret a thing. <laughs> Thank you, Laura, still. Yeah, thanks for the support back then. I mean, I wasn't so feeling so brave at the time, but um, yeah, but in the end, I'm really happy for all the people who also came forward. I mean, giving them kind of an opportunity to finally speak out about this stuff. That was uh, really, really nice to see in the end. Yeah, but apart from that, if you have any more questions con concerning other cases or other things or share experience of yourself, feel free, we still have a little bit of time. Uh, I have a question mm -hmm. um, related to the story still, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no worries. <laughs> um, what do you think about the um, ethics of social media in this case? Um, for example, hypothetically, if um, the your editors decide not to put that conversation in the original story, and but you still have this conversation and notes, um, would you consider tweeting and you have a Twitter platform like would you consider tweeting it as a journalist as uh, in that way um because uh, nowadays a lot of journalists use Twitter as a kind of notebook almost or the b-side or the side cut of their reporting um to relay these things that happen um maybe not as you know extreme as this case, but it does happen. Um, and I always have questions about the ethics of e uh, journalists publishing in these very gray zone um, mm. places. And what are the, you know, sometimes it could be very important when it's like a political situation or like a 
natural disaster or whatever but um where does how does music controversies fit into that? yeah well that's really difficult to answer i mean i would be first curious why um why our editorial team or why the people i work for wouldn't be um be up for printing this i think this is the first conversation i would like to to, to have like why are we not including it is it because we are i, I don't know like i think they're the reason that I would have to read me know the reasons why we're not um, why we're not publishing it and then I mean if I were like a really super free freelancer I would probably offer my piece somewhere else where we could publish it I mean I think I'm really careful with um, with publishing things independently from like it's not really publishing even I don't know I, I think if you think about your own credibility I'm always kind of cautious when it's just my own platform so I really I think it's always good to have a yeah as I said as a, have a publication or have a have a team in your back and not be just you basically um putting something out I don't know it's, it's difficult how do you feel about that Christopher uh, I mean it can be it I'm, I'm i'm thinking very hard of of doing it in a way that still makes you sound credible you know mm -hmm. because I, th I think like the credibility of something that you just like you know bang out on twitter is always by default less than uh, if you publish it in a magazine where people also know okay there's like more people involved in like kind of like editing and like telling the story fact checking even like discussing like certain aspects of it um, I think it has been like an important platform for especially private people who want to make something public, yes. Um, but uh, when it comes to journalists, I would automatically be skeptical. Uh, why don't they publish this um, in, in a regular pub publication? And um, especially with very sensitive topics like that, um, uh, where it's, yeah, it would have been Laura, Laura's word against his, right? And uh, we can already see how, like, the imbalance of him, like, posting something on Resident Advisor against her just publishing a piece in Groove magazine. Like, I mean, I was there to, like, basically deal with the fallout of this for, like, for, like, a week or something as the online editor. Like, I was, like, constantly on social media, like, trying to, like, sort of, like, do damage control about this. Because, um, um, and that's what still makes me so angry. Um, um, because resident advisor, they were totally, you know, like the they had so much more power, just because, and um, and so yeah, if you if you think through that scenario, and you have someone with like I don't know, like a Twitter account of like five hundred followers or something, like, uh, and then you have like resident advisor like stepping in, like, and it's even more Dave David versus Goliath um, um, sort of scenario. So I think. Um, you can try to do it, um, but you really have to think about A, uh, will people believe it? And uh, B, um, what may the repercussions be? And that's what I would say. <laughs> I, I hope that kind of answers it. I know. Uh, uh. <laughs> yes. yeah no it's it's a very yeah um, and of course i think it depends too yeah like what is your platform like how credible you are and a lot of yeah those are good questions to ask them. yeah i mean if you're like like the editor-in-chief of the new york times and you twitter something i mean sure right <laughs> but me with my 300 followers i'm not so sure um and I don't know. I mean, I still, I don't know if, how you feel about that, but it's still, it is the thing of, of, it's also a question of, of gender also. I think if, if it's a woman, you have to prepare yourself that you're being questioned like 10 times as much um, when you, when you do something, when you publish something. And I, I, that's, I mean, it's, it's nothing that I can scientifically prove, but it's just the experience um, that I've had. But I want to say something. It's interesting what Jamie said, because now we can see that too much uh, press and media and publications are made in tweets, are made by what artists, what labels, what uh, pers public persons tweet or publish in their Instagram or, or publish in their Facebook. So it's interesting that we, as a journalist, maybe we need a platform to be to 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 be legitimated a, a, a legitimated opinion, but we, as a journalist, can 
take some tweets of an artist and made a, a, a piece, for example, or, or, or take an a Instagram stories and, and made a piece or construct a piece of, of, of all this uh, social media material. Mm -hmm. It's interesting yeah, it's for me. Super helpful for your research and also like for, for confirming, like actually it was such a big help that people were tweeting like the Black Madonna back then, still called the Black Madonna, was tweeting about it. And um, that made, made us look so much more credible, of course, in that moment, like they were really showing support. And then, you know, like, yeah, and you can, can quote those tweets, which is, uh, which is kind of a common thing to do nowadays. Um, and to, to include this in your research is super helpful. I especially use it for like for, for opinion pieces as well also like to see like who says what about a certain issue and now i want i want to ask something we have been talking about boundaries and ethics when it treats about a person's individuals but what happened with it uh, is about for example that a club is running with public money a uh, production of product of, of corruption, for example, or product of narco, narco traffic, for example. Do you think that we as a journalist have to put the light in this, in this, uh, in these topics, for example, how the, how the clubs get the money to make bookings, um, et cetera. There are many, ta many topics. I, I, now comes to my mind this theme about why Awakening Festival in 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 Netherlands book uh, not book any make any 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 act any Latin American act but in Latin America they come and and, and they tour as a an Awakening Festival I don't know two topics more two three topics more to do that do you if you do you think that we should cover oh yeah definitely I mean. Those are some very interesting points to get into. I think, yeah, definitely. I mean, I don't even know if that's really like an ethical question if you don't work for the club, basically. I mean, if you're a journalist and you see something um, like structurally happening there, I think it's, it's basically your obligation to report about this, I would say. I don't know, any other comments on that? Yeah, I would totally agree. I mean, um, uh, especially the... Um a topic of where clubs, how clubs are being run like financially. I mean, if you think about it, Amnesia was raided like a few years back and there were like literally, there was like 2 million euros in the walls, hidden in the walls. Like this is like, that's some serious, like, I don't know, like Scorsese sort of like gangster movie shit. And um, um, even even smaller clubs, like within within the scene, like there's like, there's like a lot of shady stuff going going, going on. And um, yeah, of course, like the whole neo-colonial mechanisms of like the festival world. Um, I, I don't know if it was Awakenings, but Deckmantel definitely also did this. They, they were going to like Latin America, South America, and like playing, uh, putting on gigs there, but never brought any DJs from their back. You have many festivals uh, that are basically colonizing Croatia right now. Um, uh, Morocco, especially as well, has has become a hotspot for European promoters, and like. We have to talk about this. We have to talk about this because, I mean, how can we, um, um, uh, you know, call this uh, scene and community something that is like so internationalist and so open-minded and so whatever? If like those like very oppressive structures um, uh, are in an inherent part of underground culture as well. So I think it is absolutely your duty to talk about this. And uh, yes, of course, uh, it's not like um, there aren't any ethical problems for that, that, that we run in, but like more on the conflicts of interest side, basically, where it's like, okay, yeah, maybe if I'm like saying this about this club, then that will result in, you know, whatever, like problems or like, if I, rep if I criticize this festival, um, I'm maybe um, this festival will not run any advertising in our magazine and that will be a like serious blow to us financially so yeah but um, I think that's well why I kind of proposed what I proposed yesterday is that we should um, also be more clear about like what our ethics are as, as, as music journalists and uh, especially music publications should do the same that's a, actually a really nice uh ending statement as well <laughs> where we are wrapping yeah. it all up together yeah um 
Well, uh, thank you very much, Laura. Um, uh, thank you for, 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 for telling your side of the story again. Um, um, I know it's um, that's been a very difficult thing. And um, um, thank you generally for everything throughout this workshop. Uh, and also the participants, of course, um, uh, who will let us in a little bit into their world and uh, talk a bit, little bit about themselves, their work, their uh, regional scenes, their perspectives on music journalism. So I'm very much looking forward to that. And uh, you probably too, because you have to see less of us and more of them. Um, and uh, so, yeah, uh, thank you so much. Um, I I'm very sorry. I think the YouTube chat kind of um, broke uh, in between <laughs> because oh. I don't know, may maybe because it's such a heavy topic, who knows? Uh, but in any case, um, um, we're going to be back uh, tomorrow for one last final time. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to it. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow.